All right, so we're now recording. Okay, hi, uh, welcome again. Thank you for, for being here today and joining us for our community hours where we're gonna talk about the 2021 Art and Feminism funding opportunities. I do wanna make a note that this session is being recorded on February 6, 2021. So if you're viewing this at another year or another time, the information may no longer be accurate, but is accurate for um, 2021. Uh, I would like you to invite you to introduce yourself in the chat uh, with your name, pronouns, location, and any art and feminism um, experience or like what your connection is to the organization, that would be great. I'll put that in the chat too as a reminder. Um, so thank you for being here. I also want to highlight that we have, uh, if you click closed captioning at the bottom, it links to a live transcript of the session, which you can also uh, click the link that's in your upper left and that will also take you to a page where that will be saved after this talk as well, if you would like to look at that for reference. Um, and as mentioned, we are recording this session. So thank you for that. Today, uh, myself, hello. Uh, Kira Wisniewski, my pronouns are she, her. I'm the executive director of Art and Feminism. Um, and I am joined today by Melissa Tamani, who uh, is the lead co-organizer of Art and Feminism, and Chris Schilling, who's the senior program officer of Rapid Grants at the Wikimedia Foundation. So I also wanna thank them both for spending some time here with us today. I do wanna acknowledge that Chris has a hard out at 10 to the hour, um, just, so we're aware of that. I think we should be good on time, but wanted to highlight that if he does make a little Irish goodbye. Um, and then I also wanna highlight that if it's helpful for anyone here that Melissa is fluent in Spanish. So now I wanna pass it over to Mel. Thanks, Kira. Hi everyone, I'm Lisa Tamani. I am one of the our plus feminism colleagues right now and as i put in the chat i've been organizing our plus feminism events since 2015. i have some experience uh up with applying to rapid grants so uh i think i can help you a little bit with that and the agenda for today uh, first of all this is going to be a one hour session um, and first we want to talk about our brave uh, friendly space agreement, which is something that we always do in every presentation uh, we host. Um, we're going to talk about rapid grants, Chris is going to uh, lead that part, and we're also talking about R plus feminism microfunding. Um, then we're going to have a, a space for you to make questions and we are going to close this session with uh, any final thoughts you have. Um, so if you go to the next slide, Kira, uh, we always start every R plus feminism event talking about our uh, safe, brave and also friendly space policy. And this is basically a reminder that uh, the goal of this session is to create an encouraging uh, to create an encouraging space for collective learning. And this, of course, requires intentional behavior from all of us in which we are uh, conscious of uh, the effects of what we do and of what we say. And we always respect other other people's experiences. And of course, we recognize that we can do this work without one another. So. Um, this is our uh, our friendly space policy, and we hope that you all agree with it. Um, and we have a, a digital version of this policy, which you can find um, on the link that is at the bottom of the slide. And we have this available uh, in Spanish and English right now. So I'm going to leave a link Kira has already shared the link uh, where you can find the policy. Thank so. you, Mel. So now um, we're actually going to pass it over to Chris to talk more about the Rapid Gra Grants program. Um, and yeah, I'll stop sharing screen and send it over to Chris now. Thanks, Kira. Uh, let me get my screen set up here. 
Okay. Is everyone able to see, is everyone able to view uh, the shared screen? Excellent, okay. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Schilling. I'm the program officer managing rapid grants at the Wikimedia Foundation. And I just wanna give a brief overview of uh, what the program is and what kind of needs it can, it can provide um, in the context of art plus feminism events. Um, so um, Rapid Grants at its most basic uh, is a program that supports various kinds of activities and programs in the Wikimedia movement, usually uh, with um, uh, in a budget that ranges between around 500 to $2,000 USD. Um, the kinds of events that we are typically funding through the program include things like workshops, edit-a-thons, contests, photo walks, uh, but we also fund a couple of other uh, things here and there like uh, software development um, and Wikimedians and residents programs. Um, uh, and actually we're quite open to other other ideas that you know might come our way. So if there's something outside of the norm, uh, of those kinds of activities that you're looking to, to try out um, for Art Plus Feminism events this year, uh, please feel free to reach out and we're really happy to work with you on you know, developing something outside of sort of uh, what, we, what we are normally funding uh, in the program. Um, so here I am on the start page uh, of, our, um, of our program and just some examples of very common requests. Uh, in terms of the kinds of expenses that we tend to see include things like food for you know your events, expenses for a series of edathons like venues and uh, space, um, reimbursement for for travel uh, that is associated with like getting folks to a physical location for an event, um, and then prizes for uh, in this case like an online writing contest, but also for other types of contests as well. Um, Grantees in the program can be both individuals as well as current affiliates in the movement. Uh, it's user groups and chapters, um, and um, and yeah, uh, that's that's kind of the the main I think uh, overview uh, for the program. Um, applications are normally uh, due between the first and fifteenth of the month, but Art Plus Feminism, being a specific campaign, has its own schedule, and so we'll be um, we'll be accepting applications through February eleventh. Uh, and we have been accepting applications for the ca campaign um, since I think January 11th, uh, about so one month exactly. Um, the few other pages I just wanna introduce you to are the guidelines and criteria page, which I'll click into here. So I'm not gonna go through everything on this page, but I think this is the page that if you are unfamiliar with the program, um, and maybe this is your first time preparing an application, uh, I would recommend just taking some time to look through the page here because it will provide some guidance around what kinds of things we fund in the program. Um, and so there's some very basic general guidelines around things that we fund. There's a lot of cases for compensation that we fund through the program, but we're not able to fund all kinds of uh, compensated roles that could potentially be involved with that activity. Um, there are certain expenses around facilities or equipment or materials that we fund. Um, if you happen to be doing a software project or a digitization project that's more technical in nature, there are expenses associated with those that we fund um, and can provide some support for. Um, I think specific to this year, uh, I think a key one, a key place to look is if you are thinking about doing your event in online or remote capacity, I think one thing I'll bring, uh, I'd like to bring everyone's attention to is that um, we are able to fund things like subscription services um, for video conferencing or webinars or other kinds of online communication that you may require for uh, running your activities. Um, we also can provide support for data that you or your participants might need to access an event, uh, understanding the fact that data costs can be quite uh, expensive um, in many parts of the world uh, for private data use. Um, and then uh, if you want to do any kind of like uh, kind of wider marketing or messaging outside of, you know, routine uh, sorts of social media posts, uh, we, we will are and are able to provide some support around that as well. Um, so just to just to uh, conclude, I think this page here, um, uh, just recommend that you take a careful look through the content on this page, just because it provides a fairly comprehensive overview of 
uh, of not just our eligibility criteria for the program, but the sorts of things that you can uh, you can request funding for um, in in a, in a good amount of detail. Um, the last thing I want to um, well, actually, there's, there's two more things I want to go through. So the, the next thing is the application page, which will be brief. Um, so in this tab here, apply for a grant. This is where you'll go to just prepare your application. And on this page, we have a number of templates prepared for um, different kinds of events that you might be running. So we have an application for edit-a-thons, ones for contests, ones for photo walks, um, and so on and so forth. And um, uh, a good question that came up uh, recently is if you're running an event that happens to incorporate multiple kinds of activities, uh, what do you do with that? Like what kind of application should you prepare? Um, I would suggest one of two things. One is uh, you could just prepare an application under other if you have one that doesn't clearly fit under a single uh, one of these templates. Or if, um, if maybe one of your events is maybe more prominent or maybe occupying more time in the, in the, um, in the grant activities as a whole, um, you can just simply go with that. So if you have an edit-a-thon that's taking up most of the time, but maybe you just have one workshop or one photo walk maybe associated with that, um, then you can just do an edit-a-thon, just note that you will be doing a photo walk in addition to the edit-a-thons for those events. The last thing I wanna just spend a little bit of time on is uh, the risk assessment tool related to uh, kind of COVID-19 uh, and pandemic related risks uh, with events. Um, one thing that you'll be asked in filling out your rapid grant proposal is um, whether your event will be taking place in person um, uh, at like a physical location uh, or whether it's remote. Um, if it is remote, then actually you don't need to worry about this tool or filling out this assessment tool since it's not necessary. Uh, but if you do plan to have a gathering, a physical gathering of some kind, um, we do ask that applicants uh, fill out this fill out this form or go through these steps uh, with this assessment tool on this page here. Uh, I'll link this into chat uh, if I can navigate back to it. Uh, actually, it appears my chat window has disappeared. So I will link it after I finish sharing my screen here. But um, in any case, uh, if you are running a, a physical gathering as a part of your activities, there's a number of steps that we ask you to take here. Um, and just a couple of notes here is that in, in this form or in this uh, assessment process, uh, you'll be asked to fill out a, a questionnaire where you'll be asked to report on uh, your own kind of local risk of spread using some uh, regulatory um, like agencies that we have linked in that tool for you to check on, you know, kind of what the overall risk of spread is in that region, as well as um, local, like what controls that you might be able to help provide to help mitigate or reduce risk of transmission uh, associated with those events. Based on that assessment tool, um, we it will like the tool provides a, an overall level of risk for your events, and we use that to make a determination over whether uh, um, an activity is fundable or not. Um, basically, it follows a cutter a color coding scheme where uh, if if um, the results of your responses to those two surveys are in a green or yellow zone, um, then that is eligible for funding. But if it's if it's in an orange, red, or maroon zone. Uh, then we can't fund it just because the risk at that point becomes too high. Um, if you do have questions as you're filling out the assessment form, please feel free to reach out to myself or others uh, that are uh, noted on the page here for the assessment tool, and we'll be happy to provide guidance or support around completing the tool or questions you might have about it. Uh, I think that's I think that'll be all for my overview. Happy to take questions, of course, um, when we get to the Q and A portion of the of the call. Um, but, um, but yeah, uh, looking forward to seeing your proposals and providing support uh, for applicants uh, for Art Plus Feminism events this year. Great, thanks so much, Chris. Um, next, Mill and I are gonna talk a little bit about the Art and Feminism microfunding. Um, so these are more on a rolling application and they are much smaller than the rapid grant. Uh, they're up to $250 uh, US. And so I also wanna highlight right now, and I'll put this in the chat as well, is that we do have uh, a quick guide about art and feminism funding, which outlines and links to a lot of the things that Chris was talking about with rapid grants, as well as with 
the microfunding. And so what the microfunding is good for, what you can use microfunding for is for the cost of childcare, refreshments, internet connectivity or other technology. And so thanks to a grant from the Wikimedia Foundation, we're able to offer limited stipends that are up to $250,000 or ooh, 250,000, that's not correct, $250 to defray the cost of internet access. Uh, and so those are for organizers in regions with internet connectivity challenges um, and other technology to support your virtual event. So to go a little bit deeper into that, we are using a lot of the framing that uh, Chris highlighted uh, that the rapid grants is as well. And so, for instance, if you know for your event, you just really need a Zoom membership, then probably a microfunding is more applicable for you than a rapid grant because just of like where the cost, the costs are there. Um, then uh, the microfunding from Art and Feminism, we can also do um, an example of a creative way that another collective used around funding here in terms of refreshments because we realized that many of our organizers are not meeting in person is um, there was a collective in Poland where they used the microfunding to help attendees pay for takeout. So they were like kind of all meeting at a certain time for their edit-a-thon and everybody ordered takeout. So everybody had the snacks that they needed to participate in the edit-a-thon. Um, and I think I just took over the part that Mel was gonna talk about. <laughs> So Mel, I don't know if you want to, of course, sorry, and invite you in to talk a little more here. No, it's okay. Um, something I would like to add is uh, that we have historically funded the cost of childcare, but you can also use this for, uh, if you have any other um, people that you are taking care of, for instance, your parents, uh, people with health uh, problems, you could use also these funds to fund uh, a service for taking care of this person for you in the day which you are going to be editing Wikipedia. Um, so it's not just for childcare. Um, and yeah, so I think that's, that's what I would add right now. Yeah, so, and I think that really the thinking behind the art and feminism microfunding is kind of like for those costs that are are smaller or less than what a rapid grant might uh, need and also we really think about it with like a lens of accessibility too because we think things like child care or you know just general care for your loved ones um, food and refreshments internet connectivity these are all things centered around access. And so we try to always center accessibility and community in our work. And so that's really kind of the lens in which we think about this microfunding. So if you have questions about that, I'm sure there are things we aren't thinking about and like what could help make your event be more accessible in that way. So please, of course, reach out and we can, we can talk about it. So the steps to apply for microfunding, um, are, are three easy steps. Um, so you wanna make your dashboard for your event. Um, and if you're, uh, so I'll drop that in the chat right now, just kind of just so those links are readily there. You wanna make a dashboard for your event. And then you wanna submit your event to the Art and Feminism event calendar. This is so your event shows up on the Art and Feminism website, which we uh, relaunched at the end of last year. Hopefully you've had a chance to check it out. And then the last thing is to complete the funding application. Um, so those are kind of the three steps to apply for the microfunding with Art and Feminism. Um, and then as I mentioned earlier, it is a rolling deadline. Um, so unlike rapid grants, which the deadline is February 11th, which is coming up, the microfunding is available throughout the year. Uh, and this is kind of a high level disbursement and priority deadline that you can use as a guide, but really um, you can, if your event isn't happening until later in the year, you don't necessarily have to apply now. The way that the micro, or the rapid grants is set up is that the thought that most of the events happen in the month of March. And so that's why we've worked that out with the foundation for rapid grants to be happening like that period now. So then the funding would be in theory in place by the time the majority of the events are happening. 
And then I just want to highlight before we open up to Q&A, um, we do have a couple additional resources on our website specifically around um, these ideas of community care, because I don't know if hopefully you've read our community care statement and I'll drop that in the chat as well. But really we're asking our organizers to think about what is the safest for the most vulnerable people in your community. So if you're thinking about, for instance, yes, that museum that you typically work with may be open uh, because of local government, but is that really what's safest for everybody who might be coming to your event? That includes like perhaps elderly folks or people who are immune compromised. Um, we really want our organizers to be thinking about what's safest for the, those most vulnerable. And in thinking like in that, those thinkings, we've tried to create some more resources and uh, tools for holding virtual events. So we've created a virtual meeting guide, um, which is currently available in English and French, and we're working on getting a Spanish translation of it right now. And, and then we also have a couple um, walkthroughs, just like uh, screen captures of how organizers might use some virtual tools. We know, of course, there's a zillion tutorials on how to use Zoom, but like our Zoom tutorial is focused a little bit on how an art and feminism organizer might use Zoom. And the same with StreamYard. I'm not sure if anybody's seen the Wikipedia Weekly um, YouTube sessions, but they've been using this tool StreamYard, which is also a pretty neat broadcasting tool. So I just wanted to highlight those as well. And I'll stop sharing screen now. And what questions are there? We'd love to answer them or try to. <laughs> um, hi, so Rachel here. Um, I guess one, one question I have is, could you apply for a rapid grant and then later in the year also apply for um, art and feminism uh, microfunding? Or is there a limit on how many times an organization can apply for funding? Uh, so I'll let Kira handle the, the case of like, if you apply for a rapid grant first and then an art plus feminism grant. Um, but on the if it's the other way around, if you apply for an art plus feminism micro grant first and then a rapid grant, uh, totally fine. No, no issues with that. Um, we, we, we like encourage folks to take advantage of both programs. Yeah, I would say we, we have the same too. We kind of, you know, the way I kind of think about it is like, we're all on the same team. Like we all are just trying to have the, our set up our organizers as best we can for success. So yeah, we're all on the same team here. <laughs> Yeah, and I think like some good cases there are like if if you know if you're hitting the funding limit for rapid grants and and there's there are other needs that that you have not been able to meet through the the budget limits for rapid grants uh, that that can be like one example of a case you know to apply for for like an art plus feminism grant but another one that Kira uh, brought up earlier um, and Melissa you you as well um, is if you're if your funding need is only like it is minimal and only like is just a few things that are relatively inexpensive. Um, the micro grants from Art Plus Feminism, I think are, are a more ideal per, like uh, program to support those needs. Great, thank you. Go Other, ahead, Joanna. Oh, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, I just have a question about venues actually. So I'm uh, planning on organizing an Art Plus Feminism editathon in Oslo, Norway, uh, in partnership with the library. But the library is usually not open on Saturdays. And so there is this issue that they need to obviously, to, in order to open the library on Saturdays, uh, they need to pay their employee and security. And I was wondering whether that would fall into the venue uh, possibilities of funding or if that's uh, completely out of it. So the, so the idea is like they're like the staff who would need to be there to like maintain the, the, the space need to be 
paid essentially and that that would need to come from an external funding source it sounds like right um yeah i think that is something that could be supported through rapid grants uh, i mean i think the concern for me is like if the compensation that is required is is quite high it, it might it might occupy quite a large <laughs> amount of the budget so i would I, depending on the the length of time and the like the associated compensation for that it might be difficult for you to get other kinds of like um you know budgetary needs satisfied by rapid grants alone um so that's the only thing i would caution in that case but if that is if that is something you want to use the grant to support sure yeah that that could be considered a venue cost okay yeah, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I have experienced uh, requesting a grant before and the rapid, rapid grants team have always walked me through the whole process. Uh, and I've always reviewed about the grants, but it was always helpful to hear from the rapid grants team. So um, about the microfunding, uh, Nina has invited me to apply for it. So I have given it a try. Um, it might cover some other expenses, need, expenses needed for our activity. And I'm just here to receive some suggestions I might find useful for the activity we'll be having here. And the guides uh, given by the Art and Feminism Group has also help me during the planning of this uh, activity. So uh, another thing is uh, I would like to ask some suggestions like uh, the techniques on how to engage uh, some of my participants, uh, other things I might include uh, during the post event participation. So, because uh, during my previous project, uh, after we had an edit on uh, some of the editors, um, they ended up uh, just being um, participants for that actual program. So I would like to engage them some more uh, for the post activities. That's all. That's a great question. Mel, I'm wondering if you have some suggestions based on your experience from editing or organizing other events. Sure. Uh, I think that's a challenge or uh, our post-feminism event organizers have in general because uh, the people we generally engage with doesn't have much time to contribute on Wikipedia and so this is something that they generally do during March as a as a way to contribute to this bigger movement so I think we should be conscious of that and also try to um, share resources with people about how to contribute how to continue contributing in light ways, for instance, uh, uploading images, correcting articles. Um, something I, I've done recently is to try to organize a sort of uh, clinic events, which is basically me uh, reserving an hour uh, during a week just to speak with the participants and to see how things were after the event, uh, if they have trouble with their articles, if they found new sources. Uh, so that's uh, a space for informal chatting about Wikipedia. And I, I think that people who are really interested in knowing more about this generally attend. Mm, and also something we, try, we have tried is to give some um, prices for the editors who contribute uh, with more articles, with more photographs, or for the editors who create the best articles. Um, and that can motivate people a lot. Uh, and we generally, the prices we, we give are books or a certain amount of money for people to buy books. Um, I don't know if I answer your question, Anthony, but that's what I've tried and it, it has worked in different levels. Uh, yes, that's very helpful. And thank you, Melissa, for that. You're welcome. Chris, I wonder if you have any examples from maybe other projects that you've seen that you could maybe share. Yeah, I have a few thoughts on this. Um, 
a couple of a couple of projects I've seen in the last year or two have really focused on um, actually a bit less on um, like the contest model um, of of programming, but more on actually building out like rich multimedia content uh, on not necessarily a large number of like articles or a large number of pages, but really trying to focus on building like uh, like a small number of high quality articles using um, you know, outreach, outreach to, if it's a biography, outreach to that person to, you know, perhaps set up some time to like do an interview or to, you know, to sit down with them to say like, Hey, we would like to, um, you know, help, help build, uh, more content about, um, you know, about your expertise or your, or your history or your contributions in this particular discipline. Um, you know, could we arrange something like, um, you know, to, to get a picture of you to add to your photo or to add to your article that 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 you would agree to. Um, and so if if you or your community have identified, you know, particular people, um, you know, particular women in your community who, you know, maybe don't have an article or perhaps maybe have an article, but it's quite limited, like maybe just a few sentences. Um, maybe there's things you can do to, you know, reach out to the person to say like, hey, we we were maybe we're, our community is interested in kind of building uh, a a better you know <laughs> better a better um, overview of of your work and um, and uh, you know what what um, what information kind of exists out there about you right now um, and so um, you know would you be willing to meet with us for how we might be able to work on that together um, and so like it, it's sort of been uh, in a few grants I've seen an interest in kind of building out a smaller number of like really high quality articles um, rather than it being kind of like trying to build lots of like a broader set of articles. So um, that, and along with that, like I'd mentioned, like sometimes I've seen in a few cases, um, yeah, the introduction of multimedia content. So like um, someone gathering like a short clip of the person saying, you know, my name is so-and-so and I'm, you know, and this is what I do. And that can be like an audio clip you can incorporate into an article page um, that can just give the article like a bit more richness and accessibility to a reader wanting to understand more about this, this person. Um, so I've seen a couple of, of projects like that, um, some, some in RAPID, some in other, in other grant programs as well. And um, that, that is something that I think is a really kind of neat take on how to, um, yeah, how to bridge uh, the gender gap in, the, in that way. Um, so those sorts of like um, more narrow focus kinds of projects I think can be interesting if there are particular people that you and your community have identified that you want to, that you want to um, kind of focus on. Chris, Joanna has asked in the chat if there's a link to that type of engagement, if you could point to that as an example. Sure, Joanna, I will, I will, I will rummage through my grants and, <laughs> and, and, and provide some examples of that. Um, I think whose knowledge, like their, their kind of, some of their programs, I think have adopted this sort of model, particularly with, with regard to um, kind of documenting pictures and gathering pictures of, of particular individuals. Um, who 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 aren't depicted on our projects? Um, so I'll 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 find some specific programs of them of them kind of um, yeah reporting on or documenting that activity for your reference. Thank you. Uh, also, something you could do is to create a Facebook group or a Telegram group and invite people to join, so you don't lose contact with them and can share news about wiki, about the gender gap on Wikipedia. I think that can also work. One, one quick thing I just wanna make a side uh, point about here is that um, in rapid grants, we are typically requesting uh, grantees to report on um, certain metrics like uh, like number of pages created, number of participants, number of new participants or new editors. Um, I, I, so while we do ask for that information, I just want to be clear that it's not necessarily the the goal for grantee. Like it's not necessarily our expectation as, as grant funders that folks need to report like very high numbers for these because sometimes that's not 
the most important thing. <laughs> um, like if your goal is not to like it, like I had said before with some of these projects that have a more narrow focus, if the goal is to develop a really high quality article and that like, and, and that, you know, typically, um, you know, uh, takes quite a lot of effort on its own, even just for one or two articles, um, that's fine. And not, not, not uh, like completely unproblematic. The, the goal is not always to report like really high metrics per se. Um, it's, it's just to report on kind of how, how you are, how, how you felt you were able to meet your goals or, or not, because sometimes that, that happens too. Certainly in the past year with the pandemic, uh, folks around the movement have experienced all sorts of disruption around their activities. And um, yeah, uh, just want to clarify here that like, while it is true that many contests and edit-a-thons do kind of take a, you know, let's let's you know prepare as many articles and build as much new content as we can. That's not always like the that's not always the um, the necessary approach to take if it doesn't fit within your goals as a community or a grantee. Yeah, I really appreciate you saying that, Chris, um, because I think that really matches the values of art and feminism too. I think as an organization, we really experienced exponential growth um, in the beginning of the origins of art and feminism. And um, we've kind of taken in part the pandemic as a time to pause and just really kind of reflect and focus more on this, the community building parts of it, as well as not just being so numbers focused. Um, I actually, Mel, I think that you, the event that you organized last year was it's kind of a great example of this where you did a very small group um, and focused on writing quality articles. Uh, I wonder if you would like to share a little bit about that. Uh, yes, we, at the beginning, we also used to plan making really big events, having 30 people involved uh, or 30 participants. But that, that does nothing necessarily me meant that the articles were high quality. So what we've done over the years is to create er eight articles every year uh, at our uh, post-feminism event. So after, um, after five uh, years, we have a significant amount of good articles. So it has been a sort of long-term project. And yes, that also uh, means that you need to be very careful about what kind of people you engage uh, in your event. You want people who are really committed to writing, for instance, to, um, and to do this work that, as Chris said, is not uh, an easy task necessarily can be uh, quite demanding to create a good article, so. I'm um, actually, we did, um, we featured on our website, Mel did a really lovely write up about the event in Lima last year. And so I just put Thanks. that in the chat as well. Do folks have other questions? Yeah, it's Rachel here again. I do. So we're actually talking with, uh, sorry, I work for the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago, and we have um, a current exhibition that is centered around um, female um, fertility and uh, the, the fertility rights and the lack of rights around the world, but also in the United States, um, a lot of it deals with <clears throat> a lack of access to abortions and restrictions to abortions. So we're talking with um, Alexandra on Tuesday about this a little bit more, um, but we were wondering if um, a, a grant would best suit uh, putting together like a panel discussion or an event um, in March and not necessarily and edit a thon right away. Although I'm really open to exploring the edit a thon, um, especially because I think um, you know we well, there's uh, such a need to uh, build out um, 
pages on uh, women identifying artists uh, who uh, work with um, fertility and uh, abortion rights and and things like that. Uh, as a society, it's something that like really nobody nobody talks about uh, in the open, and. Um, artists uh, are who deal with this matter or who have um, this work aren't really uh, celebrated in exhibitions in this way. Um, so I was wondering um, what that would look like if, if we uh, if we had to do an adathon or if we could also build um, uh, events, use, use these grants for events that um, bring awareness to the community. Uh, I can take that one, Kira, to start if you'd like. So, Rachel, yes, like it, it is not necessary to run an edit-a-thon like with an event. M many people do, but it's not uh, like a required uh, component for for events. Nor is like uh, having a um, nor is having like uh, an activity where folks are contributing to Wikimedia projects directly. It is common, but it's not not necessary per se. I think what would be important though in that kind of proposal is to understand sort of what the intersection is between those activities and 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 the Wikimedia movement or 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 the community's kind of relationship or connection to the Wikimedia movement in some way. Um, Rapid Grants is designed to support kind of open open and free knowledge and much of that is typically centralized and in, in the work that happens on Wikimedia projects in some way. But it's not necessary that every event that we fund is, you know, a, you know, people sitting down at their computers and like writing out articles as such. So I think it would just be helpful in your proposal to kind of explain what you see that connection being and, and how folks will be able to orient themselves um, to, to the movement in some way um, as, a, as a consequence or as, a, as an outcome. Uh, from from the panel discussion or, or its associated events. Great, that's really helpful. Thank you, Chris. Sure. And yeah, I think overall, like a panel discussion, like on the subject matter, I think is is it would be quite valuable. Uh, it's a complex topic and certainly has uh, a, a sufficient number of, of facets to it that mer merits like a. a you know, more than just to say like a single, uh, a single presentation as such. Yeah, <laughs> that's very true. <laughs> no, that's great. And I'm glad to hear that you're going to be talking to Alexandra um, this following week. Any other questions? Rachel, do you have more? Because I know you're new. You know, if you ask us your questions. <laughs> no, I think I think you all you all did a really great job covering my two base questions. And then um, I think on Tuesday, we'll bounce some ideas um, off of Alexandra, uh, you know, some more to, to, to flesh out and see what our best options are. Great. Um, one other quick comment I can make is just to give folks an idea of our general kind of ethos and approach to like grant making. Um, in, in rapid grants as well as some of our other programs too, is that we really try to work hard to work with applicants to develop successful applications. It's, it's, an, it's rare that we find ourselves needing to reject a proposal unless like very fundamental needs aren't met. But um, like if there's an issue or concern with the budget or like certain like uh, descriptions in, in the proposal, like we'll we'll just talk to you about them and say like hey we could use some clarity around this point or you know we we you know let's talk about your budget because we have some we have some needs around these particular items um, and we'll work with you to make those revisions it's but it's not the case that we like receive a proposal and just reject it outright un unless it's like flagrantly like <laughs> unless there's like really flagrant problems with it um, but um, but yeah, like uh, certainly for art plus feminism events, my my experience working with grantees and applicants in the program has been one where we sit down, you know, to do some, you know, communication basically around the proposal through email or in a call to to work on you with your proposal. So if there's concerns that you know this is a new program, I'm not familiar with, uh, I'm not familiar with it. I want to get it right. Um, it's okay if the proposal isn't perfect, that's not a problem. And we want to work with you to make it, to, to help you make it as successful as you can be. Yeah, and I think that that 
thank you for saying that, Chris, because I think it just it goes back to like what we were saying earlier in this discussion, too, is that we're really just all on the same team. Like the reason why any of these programs exist is because we really want to set up our event organizers for as much success as possible. And so the this the systems that we have in place are really just to like kind of keep things organized. We're not trying to do any kind of bureaucracy for the sake of bureaucracy. Um, so we're and we're also we're all people behind these systems too. So feel free to to talk to us. We're happy to to talk to you talk these out because again we just we have the same common goal of having successful events. All right. Well, if you have other questions, again, you know how to reach us. Um, we're happy to, to field them. Um, I want to thank Chris again and Melissa again and all of you for, for joining us this morning um, or afternoon or evening, wherever you are in the world. And we will have this again will be recorded. So if you want to re revisit it, you definitely can, as well as the notes are also going to be available. So folks can take a look either yourself if you want to revisit anything or also other people who might be viewing this for the same or the first time. Um, so I hope that everybody has a great rest of their Saturday. And uh, thank you again for joining us today. I had just one other quick thing to, to of say. Of course. To, sorry, say to Rachel. Rachel, I didn't, I didn't mention this, but I'm, I'm also based in Chicago. So if you if you do end up uh, finding yourself uh, you know applying for a rapid grant, uh, be happy to swing by the event if it's if that, if that would be okay by you. <laughs> oh, absolutely! Yeah, you know what, um, Chris, can you put your uh, or geez, um, you know if you go to mocp.org um, or we can connect offline. But um, mm -hmm. if you feel safe in person, we have socially distant. Um, safe uh, tours and things like that, but I would love to give you a tour of the exhibition. Sure, that would be lovely. Uh, thank you, it's very kind of you to offer. Um, I'll also just put my email address here in chat in case folks need to reach out to me. I, I know some of you uh, have it already, <laughs> but in case um, in case it's necessary, uh, feel, feel free to reach out to me there. Or if you have questions about rapid grants broadly, um, our email is rapidgrants at wikimedia.org. Right. And um, I, I'll also just drop in this as well, the art and feminism email. Um, the best one to, to reach us is just the general one, um, which is just art and fem info at artandfeminism.org. But you could also reach me directly, um, which would be Kira at artandfeminism.org. Um, so thank you again, everyone. Um, have a great rest of your weekend. And we look forward to hearing and learning more all about your events. Thank you.